All right, welcome to today's training. Thank you so much for joining us, whether you're live or whether you're watching this later and you can't be here live, that's okay. The, the principles and the laws, they all remain just as effective, whether live or not. Um, hopefully, if you are live, you'll submit some questions. If there's some kind of uh, clarification you need with some of the things that I'm talking about, I would love to stop and really drill down. As a matter of fact, the drill down is what I like more than I do kind of aggregating topics or, or, or laws or principles at a high level. So if there's something you have interest in or something you have a comment about, or maybe a self-experience about, certainly we would hope that you would engage and interact with us through the chat. And then uh, if you got, you know, we'll, we'll, I'll ask you to unmute yourself and then we can kind of dialogue. So know that that's available today. Today's um, topic, is different than I wanted it to be. You know, we all have to pivot. We all have to make changes based on the circumstances that come at us. And I think uh, certainly today's topic is not about being rigid and the fallacy of being rigid in the, in the wake of circumstances and, and being malleable. Well, we would have had to be malleable with our training because I did uh, originally, if you guys were on the uh, training last week, we were gonna start covering this today but uh, I ordered ours that day, literally last week uh, on Thursday, and we just received ours late yesterday, like after we left. So everybody in our staff is doing this as well, and we just got these. And I know that if I'm dealing with that problem, you are probably dealing with that problem too. So we're going to hold off on doing the book until next week. I will make an announcement. Todd, uh, don't let me get out of this thing without uh, teasing this book again. Okay. Yep. That sound good? All right. And then we'll, what we'll do is we'll cover chapter uh, one and chapter two, which is like, ends up being like 46 pages. And again, it's, you know, it's a pretty simple read. It's not fine print or anything. Uh, I know, like I said, we got, I got one of these. Uh, Stacy and I bought one for each member of our staff and, and we're all going through it. The idea is to get better, to become the better people that we can be. And if you guys have been around me or my training for any length of time, you have an understanding that I deeply, deeply believe and know that the only way we're going to go anywhere in life is to help others get where they want to go. Um, so, and that, I, I, what that really boils down to is influence. And I want to discuss what influence means and what a broad term that can be. Um, you'll pardon me as I, as I quench myself during this. And what a broad term that can be and how it can apply to almost anything in our lives. Now, certainly the first time I really ever started thinking about or meditating or, or really drilling down um, on this word influence, it started with the word leadership. Like I was studying leadership principles and, and I heard uh, someone say that leadership by definition boiled down to its finest essence is influence, right? You're leading someone, you're influencing them to go somewhere, do something, make a decision. Certainly sales is that. And I know that this isn't sales training. This is more mindset and success training. And what I mean by that is influence can be in any part of your life. Now, my belief and my complete contention, and I would be willing to debate anyone on this, is that when we come into contact with someone even if we're walking by, whether it be the cashier at the grocery store or a meaningful relationship, uh, you know, a conversation with the neighbor, whatever those interactions may look like and whenever they may happen, my submission is, is there, there is an influence that we have in their life and it's either positive or negative and it could be very small or it could be very large, right? I've been with people and they tell me something that's like, wow, that that like that, that that changed me right it had a huge influence on my life and and then sometimes i'm just feeling down and a buddy will smile at me or laugh at something and and, and that will have a, a positive not not a huge influence in my life but certainly a positive influence in that moment so when i talk about influence i'm, I'm talking about something that's very broad and applicable to a lot of things and i'm also talking about something that i very deeply believe in i I really want to increase my influence. And my hope is that everyone who's watching this or anyone who would take time out of their day to become better or try to become the better them that they could become, that they and you too would also understand and appreciate the depth and the importance of influence, whether it's, you know, I think about teachers and, and how they want to influence their students. I think about parents and how we want to influence our children to make right decisions and to be productive. And, and I think about whether you're an employee or an employer. You know, there's a book by John Maxwell called 360 Degree Leader. 
And the premise of that book is you don't have to be at the top of an organization. You don't have to be at the top of a pyramid or the line or whatever you want to call it, the totem pole to have, to be a leader, to, to be influential. I mean, in that book, they were talking about the, um, uh, what's the old IBM Welch, John Welch, is it, what's that? Welch, Welch. the old IBM um, CEO, he used to walk around into the shipping docks and got, he was a good connector and he would request ideas from anywhere. And there was one, uh, it was a forklift driver and I'm gonna beat, beat up the story, it's been years since I read it, but the premise of it is there's a forklift driver who gave him an idea which ended up saving the millions of dollars. So the point is, and, and even if you're, let's say, let's just take that analogy, right? The, the shipping yard, the, the, you know, the, the, the warehouse. Well, you can have influence there by being the hardest working guy or gal in the place, right? We can influence people with our effort. We can influence people with our attitude. And listen, I didn't even plan on telling you the story, but I, I'm going to tell the story. Remind me of the two bag story, Todd. Don't let me go without the two bag story. I don't know if it's appropriate now, but it certainly will be. But the point is, is that influence matters. And I want to, let's just, like I said, we, I think the easiest example, and I know not everybody watching me or, or is going to be a parent, but certainly we know parents, right? If you're not, um, just think about the children. Like for me, I want to influence my kids to be productive. I want to influence them to have a purpose every day. I want to influence them to serve and to serve others and to do things to the best of their ability and to dream big, right? I want to influence to take chances and, and not be afraid to fail. Well, influence as much as I want those things, and, and certainly I, I think we all have common ground on those, those six things that I just listed, but as much as I want that for my kids, even though I have the title of dad, my influence and in, in the, the, the effectiveness and the potency, right, of my influence is going to depend on greatly on how much I've earned the right to influence. Now, in a parent situation, it's much like, a, a, they, it's called, um, golly, what's it called? Um, I'm so sorry that I'm drawing a blank on this. Positional leader. You know, what I call a clipboard leader or a name tag leader, right? You're, somebody's a leader because they were given the title of a manager, but they, they haven't earned the right at all. That's a different place to start, which is, is, a, is a starting place for leadership. So when I say a positional leader, I'm not saying that with cynicism. That's a lot of times where great leadership begins. It's like they're given an opportunity to lead and it starts with this label or this title. But then to be an effective leader, you got to get past that. As a father, certainly that's a different environment, right? It's not just a title. I'm the dad. I do have influence. But take it away from the parenting thing. And even as a dad, I have to earn, especially with my 13-year-old boy, especially right now with my 13 year old boy, I tell you what he sees quicker than anybody in the world is a lack of authenticity. And when he sees that, I can, I can just see, I can smell, I can hear my influence dropping on him at that moment. Like right now, I, James doesn't watch these, but if he did, in fact, I may even show it to him though he's, he's a part of it, but um, I, he would tell you if you asked him, and I haven't asked him and talked about it, but he would tell you, I bet you, that I have more influence over him right now because he knows that I'm engaged in these 30 days uh, goals and he understands the sacrifices that I'm making. We haven't talked about it, but he and I are close, right? We, we live together. He, he's, we're part of each other's life. So I when I'm being authentic and when I'm doing what I'm, when my, when my actions are lining up with my words, I have more impact and I have more influence on my, on my boy. And that holds true with everybody. So I just wanted to start at a place of common ground and talking about a parent-child relationship. But at the end of the day, what I'm talking about spans over all relationships. And it's not linear. It's not a relationship that, oh, well, I, I can't be influential to them because they're my boss. I, my staff influences me all the time. Um, you know, we were having a meeting the other day and, and I mean, you guys influence us, right? You know, as sales reps, a lot of the great ideas that get implemented are, are influenced by your suggestions. So it's not linear. I want you to think of when we influence, the first thing I want to cover is I want you to think that it's 360 degrees. Leadership boiled down to its finest essence is influence. When, we, when you're in sales, we want to lead people through that sales process. Whether you're selling a car, whether you're selling insurance, it doesn't matter. There's a process that you have to go through and somebody's got to lead and somebody's got to follow. 
So I want to increase my influence, which is one of the reasons why we created the business model that we did. Excuse me. We did so because we wanted to multiply this message of CBD, right? We want to multiply this message of health and wellness and, and that we can achieve some of the even better results than, than some of these awful big pharma solutions or, or quasi solutions to health. And, and we knew that we didn't have $100 million to get that word out and really have influence on a lot of people just by splashing it out. So we utilize this so that we can multiply our influence. And the why, and you guys know that our mission statement is to get the hand, get CBD into the hands of as many people as we can and help people make money doing so. So our mission statement is causal to, to a multiplication standard. And I'll get into that a little bit, but how do we earn the right to influence people? I said it already. Um, first of all, you have to be authentic. And, <clears throat> and what I mean by that is, it's one thing for me to say, hey, you guys, you need to create some goals, you need to do this, you need to do that. If I'm not doing it, to me, that, that kind of moves the authenticity scale the wrong way. Uh, I just mentioned it with my boy. I mean, if, if I'm not, I'm asking him to do things and make sacrifices. And if I'm not making sacrifices and doing those things, I mean, think about me sitting here smoking a cigarette, telling my kids not to smoke, right? How, how impactful am I going to be? What, what, what grade is my influence over my boy going to be if I'm telling him not to smoke while smoking? So you have to be authentic. It's secondly, it has to be others oriented. And this is the hardest thing. And, and I love having open discussion. And certainly this isn't the forum, but like I said, most of the time I train, it's in a personal session and we can actually have, I want, I actually tell people when I'm in those environments, I want you to challenge me. If you feel like I should be challenged, I want you to have an, an idea that may conflict with my idea and a perspective that may conflict with mine. Because like I said, I like drilling down. I like having meaningful conversation. <clears throat> so it, when we talk about making things about others first, that would be something that sometimes people would push back. Well, I got to feed my family. Well, you know, you've been in the airport, right? And it's like, take care of yourself first. So you can take care of others. And, and I can work through that because those are really two separate conversations. But the reality is, is that the human condition is rife with vanity and pride. You must know that. You must know. I mean, if anybody's had a child, does the child think that the whole does is the child thinking of the world or thinking of themselves? I mean, shoot, I know grown adults that still don't think about the world and they're thinking about themselves, right? I too at times am very self-oriented and self, you know, self-focused. It's not easy. It goes against our our human condition. But I would say that I, I know this and, and, and I can probably get an amen from somebody. But once we do begin to serve, once we do begin to put others ahead of us, it, it becomes addictive. It's like drinking water, right? I mean, if you drink the, the amount of water you're supposed to drink and you did that on day one and you're not used to drinking water, it'd be like, golly, get water away from me. But if you do that over time, it becomes addictive. Like, you man, I just want more water. I just want more water. So you got to be genuine. It has to be others oriented. And listen to this, it takes sacrifice. Relationships take a ton of energy. I mean, to be truly a connector with people, it just takes energy and it takes sacrifice of time. It takes sacrifice of self. It takes sacrifice of, you know, personal desires at times. The only, not the only, but excuse me. You see, I'm like multi-drinking here today double fisting. Um, the example I thought about is of my grandparents, um, both grandmother and grandfather on my dad's side is what I thought about. And I was, I was at both of those. My grandfather on my dad's side, his name was JT Pitts, James. Um, and then my grandmother, they passed away about three years apart, I think. Stacy would probably correct me on the timing, but anyway, it wasn't right at the same time. And my grandfather was a, 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 a pastor for like 62 years or something. I mean, crazy. And at both of their services, at most, and like there are at most services, right, there was a time for people to come up and just share a few words on the impact that they had on their life. And the neat thing about having a 64-year ministry is not only was I there firsthand, you know, as they were happening, I was very close with my grandparents. In fact, for years lived like a mile away from them and spent a lot of time with them. Um, 
but the the resounding thread that that was consistent through both of those services and 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 all the people that came up some of them were small families some of them it was one person some of them was a married couple but it, it was all about time it, it was all about time you know it's like that's what they appreciated the most was the time and it was stories like the daughter, you know, was in the hospital all night and, and they didn't know if they were going to live. And, and, you know, JT and his wife, pastor, pastor Pitts and his wife stayed there all night till eight the next morning. I mean, they were true connectors of people and they were sacrificial. Um, I'm just thinking right now of a story where we were in church one time and I had on a pair of shoes um, and I can't remember the, the brand name, but on the, on the sole of the shoe, was branded the name of the shoe and the name has a circle right like this it's like it's not even a circle it's more like a football and then the names inside it well i was in church one day and i crossed my legs and my my grandfather from a, another pew down the way saw that he thought it was a hole in my shoe so like the next day he dropped by with a brand new pair of shoes like I didn't ask me and I just I know that may sound like something simple and I actually had to tell him I was like no grand, pop, poppy was what I called him I was like no these are like the it, and I showed him I go no like they're new shoes in fact when these start wearing in you won't see this anymore but it was amazing that he was so thoughtful and and that's really like he is probably one of the most influential people in my life that that man of which I talk so I know it requires a lot of sacrifice to earn the, the right to really influence people on a deeper level. Now, like I'm not, I'm not talking about throwing a smile or, you know, being a good listener or, you know, there, there's ways that we can impact people in the everyday walk of our life. But when we, I'm talking about deep, meaningful impact to do that. Uh, and, you know, think about kids, think about students, think about if you're a manager, think about if, if you're anywhere and you, you have a peer group, you have a, 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 a colleague group, it, right? So it, it spans over everything. It has very little to do with selling anything, certainly CBD, and it has more to do with how are we going to impact people, right, on a deeper level. So I think about all the people that are on this, uh, this training that have sacrificed time and have sacrificed effort to learn about our marketplace, to learn about CBD, to have a good understanding about how our business works to the benefit of their customers, right? So that's kind of what I'm talking about. Now, we want to grow that influence. We want, if we've got a great message, I want more people to hear it. So for more people to hear it and it to actually have a resonating impact on them to cause action, it's there's some rules that we have to live by. So I'm going to cover some of them today. Uh, I had hoped to keep this a little bit shorter uh, to keep a little time for interaction. Should that, you know, happen. Uh, and I know most people actually watch this recorded. So I understand that, but I think that's the value of being live is that you actually can ask a question that's pert to yourself. Um, certainly we're talking at, you know, 20,000 foot views. It, again, it'd be nice to drill down. Bear with me. All right. The first, the first one that I thought of, and this is a John Maxwell thing, it's called the law of the lid. Todd, you ever heard the law of the lid? No. Not heard the law of the lid. The law of the lid really has a couple different meanings. Um, the first one is, and it goes back to the, the idea that we attract who we are, right? I always used to tell people, if you don't like, so people that are attracting, trying to attract people to their business opportunity, and they, they're getting this certain type of people that aren't the type of people, quote unquote, that they want to attract. And I would always say you attract what you are, not what you want, unless you are what you want. And then you will attract what you want. What I mean by that is if we want to attract sharp, uh, successful, disciplined people, we're going to have to be sharp, successful and disciplined, right? Like, so think about it. John does a good job of describing it as on a scale one to 10, right? So if I'm a six, I'm there, the, an eight is not going to be attracted to me or my opportunity. Think about it as if I'm putting together a baseball team, right? I'm thinking of that old, uh, that old uh, movie Sandlot. What a cool movie. But you, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to, you're trying to attract good baseball players to your baseball team. But if you are a five baseball team, 
you're not going to attract the superstars that are nines and tens, eight, nines and tens. So it's incumbent upon our life. If we want to attract those types of people that we admire, those types of people that have things that we don't. And I don't mean monetary things. I'm talking about a successful marriage, you know, meaningful, deep relationships with their children. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're members and, 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 and involved in their community, whatever that looks like, we have to increase ourselves to be attractive to those that we want to be attracted to. Now, I have a law, a rule that I never want to be in the, the smartest person in the room. And, I, you know, that's a cliche, but not for me. I mean it. I don't want to be, I, I wouldn't mind like having a good knowledge of something in the room. Don't get me wrong. I'm like an idiot, but I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. Now, I know people that intentionally associate themselves with people that are if they're a six they're 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 wanting to attract fours all right so listen if we want to attract people that uh are have a higher level of uh you know are, are at a greater level we must first make ourselves attractive to do that the second thing is oh we got leandro in okay the second thing is if we want to grow well, I guess it's the first thing. I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted. But if we want to grow our influence, we must first grow ourselves. Now, listen, I think about it. One of the, I, I believe one of the easy mechanisms uh, with which we can judge this. And again, I'm going to go back to the parent, you know, the parent child relationship. M my prayer is that I give my children a lot of room to grow. Right. And, and, and my prayer is that I give my staff room to grow. The, the animal can't outgrow the cage, meaning it, it. And I wish we did have video here because you'd see me popping my hand against my top hand because my children are relegated to my lid. My staff are relegated, at least within the, the confines of this business. They can only grow. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Hey, we're back. They can only grow as much as the leader grows. Meaning if, if I, I like my James is here and, and listen in math and algebra, he's already created headspace between he and I, like, I don't even understand his homework in seventh grade, eighth grade now, literally. So Leandro's putting that together. There we go. Thank you, buddy. I think we're good. I'm going to, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So listen, if, if you, and for those of you who have reps under you, like if you've tried to, you know, disclose our opportunity and you actually have people, you owe it to them. You owe it to anybody in your life that you have direct influence over. You owe it to them to create headspace so that they can grow. Right. I did a, I did a, a, a little post this morning about, you know, think about the people that are depending on you to make that change in, in your lives, to, to reach that goal, to, you shared it with somebody and, you know, you want something better for your kids. You want something better for your spouse. You want some that, you know, think of those people that are depending on us to reach our potential so that they can grow so that they have room. That's the law of the lid. It's our responsibility. If we want to have influence to increase our lid so that not only do we attract people that are greater in these areas of life and are, have found success in some areas of life, but we create headspace. We create the room for the people that we're influencing in our lives. Certainly parents have an obligation to do that. Certainly teachers have an obligation to do that. We all do because there's so many relationships that you and I have in our daily walk where we have influence over people. And if you don't have influence over people, it's only because you're not trying, because you always have influence, even in the walk by, right? Even in the dealing with the cashier, there is an exchange of energy. Is it gonna be positive or is it gonna be negative? The first thing is the law of the lid. Keep our growth is, is for us, but it's for others, right? Remember I said, we gotta think of others first. We have to create that headspace. We've got to create room for people to grow. And if you're influencing people, the, the, the further, you know, speed of the leader, speed of the pack. If you're going slow, that means everybody else behind you is going slow. Now you may not be a leader at all. I would say, I heard it funny. It's like, if, if you're, if you call yourself a leader, but nobody's following you, you just out for a walk, <laughs> right? 
increase your influence by increasing ourselves. Okay, so that's first and foremost. Two, and I've already talked about, influence is earned. It doesn't matter how much you know. It doesn't matter what quotes you can spit out, what scriptures you can throw out. It doesn't matter. It's earned. You may have influence over somebody because of a title. Think of this, right? Um, Todd is the best at making widgets and we're all widget makers and you're here for three months and Todd has just been the best widget maker ever in the land and Todd's coming to talk to this group about making widgets. Well, yes, because of Todd's success, because of his record of, of actual success, Todd actually has credibility. But if he doesn't continue with that, right, it won't sustain unless it's earned. So we have to earn the right to influence people. And it may, you know, words, here's like one of the things I think about sometimes is an easy way to do it is if your words match, match up with your, your actions, then that's integrity. That, that earns respect, right? If, if you do what you say and say what you do, that earns respect. If you're doing the things that you're asking others to do, right? Again, it's that, that, non-authentic i'm sitting there smoking a cigarette telling you how bad cigarette smoking is and you shouldn't be smoking cigarettes and let me break off on a tangent you know i i'm gonna i'm gonna get i i do have a little bit of a preacher in me i told you about my grandfather my other grandfather was a preacher for like 32 years so i've got preacher in me um i i don't have the gift of tongues but i'll run an aisle on you right <laughs> okay all right so anyway influences earn words and actions need to line up and listen you got to get results you you have to get results the thing i was going to say in the past and I'm, I'm, I'm i threw in the results to parlay back into what i want to share with you a lot of times we look back on big mistakes we've made um you know we look back with regret at times. We, we, you know, I'm thinking of, of things in my life where I just made some really, really horrible decisions and had some really bad consequences to deal with. Do you know that the value of those huge errors and those small errors is that when you come out of the other end of it, and I'm thinking of addictions, I'm thinking of, you know, big problems, right? When you come out of the other end of it, what, what we do is we earn the the key the metaphorical key to open doors and walk in and influence people that we never would have been able to influence think about the person who's overcome alcoholism what a message he or she has to share to those who, who are dealing with addiction think about the person who's overcome food addiction think about the person who's overcome gambling think about the other person who's overcome you know uh, anything when you go through those we lament it we sometimes you know, we curse God or we're angry because of these horrible things that most of the time, if we own our stuff, we would understand our own um, uh, production of that on our own lives. But man, as hard as it is to get through that, the value of it is your hindsight becomes other people's foresight. So I would, I, I don't know, to, to me, it kind of feels really organic for me to think that. So I think there's a message out there for somebody who's going to listen to me or is listening to me now that whatever you've gone through that maybe you're not proud of, be, if you're on the other side of it and you've figured out at least some mechanism to deal and manage and maybe even completely overcome it, man, I, I would, I would encourage you today to share that. I would say that I can't walk through the door that you are able to walk through to influence the people that are on the other side of that door. I would, I would encourage everyone, man, share your, share your experiences, the, especially the ones that are, are tough because other people are going to go through them or are going through them. So I know I got off on a tangent there. I'm sorry. Um, number three, you must have a vision. Golly, I know I feel like I'm, I'm beating a dead horse, but I've, I've done a lot of analytical training on training. And the amount of times you have to keep saying things for it really to kind of be ensconced in a part of culture is innumerable. It's, it's almost shocking how many times you have to say something. Uh, and I'm a part of that too, right? So it's, it's not judgmental, but you have to have a vision. You got to have a dream. You got to have a why. You have to have a reason. You have to have somewhere you're going. Excuse me. And I know I've said it over and over, 
I don't care if you can see the picture clearly. That's okay. Don't be like that. Start moving. Start walking. Create the mess. And then we'll clean it up. But man, take action. Don't suffer from paralysis by analysis. Have attack. It's that, you know, that story I told you about the outhouse, right? You hold the lantern up high. It, it casts a broad light. You can see where you're going. You can't make out anything on that house. You just see a silhouette. That's all you got is a silhouette. You got your, your, your point of origin. You put the lamp down to your feet. You pay attention to what you're doing. The three foot rule, right? Be where you're at. I can only impact three feet around me. Don't, don't start thinking about a, a halfway there. Focus on your feet so you don't fall. And then every now and again, you got to stop. And you got to hold it up again and make sure, okay, I'm still going the right direction. And next time you hold it up, you look and you're like, oh, I can see the little moon cut out of the door. I'm starting to see it. That's the way it works. It's not the other way around. You don't see, I mean, you're not going to see everything. And whatever you do see that pulls you, you may say, put pits, mine's clear, mine's clear. Praise God, right? That's good. But it's going to change probably by the time you get there. That's okay. Just get on the road, man. Just get on the road. The, the seek is where the beauty is. The seek is where the miracle happens. There is no destination. That's, 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 the, that's the big trick on everybody. And it relates back, Todd, to that video that I showed that happiness happens before success. It's not the other way around. Oh, when I make this money, I'm going to be happy. Oh, when I get this job, I'm going to be happy. Oh, when we move into this house, I'm going to be happy. It doesn't work like that. It's statistically and intellectually backwards, right? So anyway. You got to have a vision. People don't follow people who don't know where they're going. Todd, if you saw a guy wandering around with no destination, would you jump in line to follow that dude? No. Neither would I. People don't follow people who don't have a destination. People don't want to be influenced by people who don't have purpose or a destination or, or, an, or attack. So that's one of the reasons why the why is so important. It's only one of many reasons why the why, the vision is so important. Got to have a vision. I've already gone over this, so I'll cover it real quick. I think I'm right on time, Todd. I feel pretty good about it right now. We attract what we are, not what we want. Be the person you say you are. Man, I spent a lifetime in churches, so y'all know, uh, you know, it, it's a microcosm of society where we all put together. I call it your representative. Like, here's the analogy that I draw. Picture this, picture this scene, right? My wife works at a company. I work at a company. Wife's company has a uh, Christmas party. First time I'm meeting all of her colleagues and peers. Big room and I'm going around, hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? They're not meeting me. They're meeting my representative, right? They're meeting the facade that we put up when we walk into something like that. And, and churches talk about it all the time, about how they don't want to be that type of place. So you understand, you get what I'm saying. It's just, you, it's that first impression, right? Oh, I got to make a first impression. I got to be, I got to know everything. I got to be charming and witty. And, and that's okay, right? That's normal. I've used that in a sales training situation where like when you go into, because when you're selling, you want to influence people. You can't do that. I, I don't know who I'm trying to influence at a dinner party. It's just to paint the picture of what we do when we don't want to expose ourselves, when it's something that we're not really sure of. But I would say, stop doing that. You can't be influential if you're not vulnerable. You're not, you're not gonna you're not gonna meaningfully for long periods or sustained periods of time influence people that you're not vulnerable with and you're not authentic and you're not open and you're not honest. So be who you say you are. And if you want to attract people with values, then be a, with certain values and be a person who exudes those values. We attract what we are. Uh, it's called the attraction factor. All right, number five, we must be able to connect with people, which is why we're reading our book. These are in no particular order. It's not like number, it's the fifth most important thing. These are just things I thought of that I know that are true. One is you got to be able to connect with people. A big part of your success and or failure is going to depend on whether you can connect with people. So you got to be a connector. <clears throat> you can't, um, what was the saying? You can't move people in actions without moving hearts. You have to, people don't know how much you care until they know how much, or don't know how much, don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You can't move people unless you stir their hearts, unless you earn the right. So the only way to earn a real right is to connect with people. And we're gonna go through what that looks like. Uh, I know this seems like a kind of a 30,000 foot view, but I would tell you that and one of the things that I noticed in this book, I haven't read it yet. Like it's there, but I haven't gotten to it. Remember I told you I've read this. I think I read this book about eight years ago. Um, connecting requires a lot of energy. 
right? I mean, think about the story that I told about my grandmother and my grandfather staying up all night through the night till the morning hours, waiting for the doctor to come out and give the, you know, the prog prognosis of their daughter. That, that takes energy, man. It takes a lot of energy to really try and connect with people and maintain that connection. Um, deep, meaningful relationships require sacrifice. It just deep, meaningful, anything requires sacrifice. All right. Number six, Todd, let me stop there. Can you go back to number four? Number four, that was, please. we attract what we are, not what we want. It's called the, the law of attraction or the attraction factor. Um, you know, I see people who good example of, you know, a, a, a real, a person who's hungry, right? And they, they want to jump on a get rich quick or an MLM or what have you. And they're trying to attract people to their business opportunity. And you know, they're a four. So the law of the lid says that if you're a four, you're not going to attract an eight, right? So this actually blends into the law of the lid and that we attract what we are. So my thing is if you like being around, you know, honest, uh, humble, you know, funny, charming, whatever the traits are, wh whatever those traits are, be that, and then you will attract that and you will be attractive to those people who share those values. So number four, thank you. We, uh, we attract what we are, not what we want, unless we are what we want, right, Todd? Thank you, buddy. All right, anything else before I move on? And we're almost done, guys. Stip be patient. I know that, man, I, that camera's messed up. Now I got out of the picture there, Toddy. All right. Um, I talk about having to earn the right to influence, earn the right to, to lead, to, you know, to persuade, to impact at, at a deeper level. Uh, influence happens after we serve. Influence and the ability or the invitation to, um, to influence others, in other words, the permission typically happens after serving people. Leadership, guys, boiled down to its finest essence is nothing more than influence. Leadership is about serving others. It rises, it falls on serving others. I, um, you know, a good example is in the church. Todd, are you familiar with uh, a, a, a church member that would be called a deacon? What do you think? Of, when you think of deacon, you think a leader? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Everybody does. I asked Todd because he and I, you know, I don't know, but I think everybody thinks a deacon's a leader, right? It's an elder, whatever. Do you know what, where a deacon came from? No. It's the Greek derivation of a word called dukinos. Dukinos means servant. Crazy, right? Because deacons are leaders. It's absolutely correct, but they're servants. So leadership is about serving others. It's not about being the guy out who's out in front of the crowd, right? I mean, certainly that's a part of it. That has nothing to do with it. I mean, there should be a mob and you're out. It has nothing to do with it. What it has to do with is, like I said, and I'll say over and over and over and over and over again, we must help people get where they want to go before we can go where we want to go. So leadership is about serving others. It's about, you know, that's the service part, right? Like if for no other reason, you know, I, I'm, I've not really been a, a self developer and, and I want to develop myself And my motivation, you know, this is a hypothetical. My motivation is, is that I want to create room for people to grow underneath me. I want to sacrifice time. I want to sacrifice what I need, need to, to become a better me so that I can influence people to become a better them. That's serving them. That's serving others. That's creating a, an action plan and a fire in your belly to assist and help and serve others. I'm telling you, all things work through the spigot of service. All waters flow through the spigot of service. And if you look at it like that, it, it's gonna uh, enable all of us to have more influence on people. Again, we need others, right? They need us. How many people, I'm gonna ask each individual, I don't know what your story is, but how many people need you to influence, to, to develop yourself? How many people need headroom? How many people need a, a voice of reason, a voice of intention, a voice of purpose in their life? How many people need to be served? How many people need to be made to feel awesome and, and told that they can do anything, right? And be a balcony person. How many people need that, that pull up? Everybody, everybody. And when we start thinking like that, like they first, they first, they first, they first, 
all of a sudden we're rising, man. All of a sudden we're going from a four to a five and a five to a six and a six to a seven. Now we're associating with people that we've admired and mentors of ours. And we feel like we deserve and we, we have earned the right to receive what we want to receive. That happens through others. That happens through service. That's the secret. <laughs> oh man, I ought to put it on a t-shirt, Todd. That's the secret, man. Number seven. Uh, if we want to attract winners in our life, and I mean winners at parenting, winners at relationships, winners at business, winners at, you know, whatever. If we want to attract winners, we got to be winners. You guys, at the end of the day, I, I have met so many very, very developed, broke people in my life. It's scary. Like they will read, learn, memorize, even try to train these principles, but don't have results. At the end of the day, Results matter. At the end of the day, if you want to win, you got to figure out a way to win. And that's it. And I know that. So oh, that's great advice, Pitts. If I want to win it, you got to figure it out. You know what I mean? You have to get results. There's no other way to really influence people. Sooner or later, somebody's going to look at you and go, where are your results? Sooner or later, it's like you're telling me to do this to win, but you're not winning. We have to find a way to win. It's a, it's a huge, like, I'm not just talking about sales numbers, right? I'm not just talking about revenue numbers. I'm talking about if you get up every day and you've got maximum effort and maximum attitude, you've won for the day because that's what we can control, right? If you get up and you let, so, oh, well, she made me do this and because of that, I had to do that. You lost. Nobody's going to want to be influenced by a person who's a victim. You can't do that. So I'm, I'm trying to give this, the definition of winning, not just be, and results, not just being tangible results. That is a huge part of it. Let's just say in this business, if you want to attract people, uh, I can think people like Dana. I mean, I can think of names of people that it would be very, and, and they do attract people. Why? In the beginning, let's just take Dana because I know she's tough. She can take it. When somebody just responds to a Facebook post or sees Dana carrying a, a tumbler and asked about, see, ask about CBD BioCare, at some point, at some point, Dana's going to have to show that she's gotten results doing this. People are smart. They understand the, the, uh, authenticity. I mean, it, it smells. It's, it's pungent when it's not authentic when you're actually looking for an opportunity. So you got to find a way to win. And you might say, well, Matthew, how do I do that? I would go back to the baseball swing. If winning is hitting the baseball, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing right now. You're focused on the approach. That's what this is. This is quadrant two activity. You're going to hear me say over the coming weeks and months, we'll talk a lot about quadrant two. That's where we grow. That's where we develop. But how many people do you know even spend one minute there? They're too busy running around this rat trap called life, trying to catch up with everything, being reactive to everything, never growing, not being intentional about influencing anybody, and then wondering why their life isn't what they want. And that, I'm telling you, this, so this is it, the approach. You want to win, you're like, Matthew, I can't hit the baseball, can't hit the baseball. Stop focusing on where the baseball is at. Focus here. Get influence people through you. I'm talking to you right now. You go get results. And then when they say, how are you getting results? You point to this. You point to the hands. You point to the approach. You influence them to put them on the best track to help them get where they want to go. And when they do, in this business, you're making money by helping them. You're repaid for helping them, for serving them, for sacrificing for them, for earning the opportunity to have influence over them. That's how it works. Everybody wants to go 10 to 1. It's 1 to 10. You got to get to first before you get to third, not the other way around. So we must win to attract winners. Um, win at developing relationships. Win at being a good listener. Win at having discipline in your day, every life. Win at doing what you say you're going to do. Write the goals, share the goals, do the goals, right? Be a person because when you do, you begin to establish an integrity and a reputation with people, someone that they can count on. You're starting to really build deep, meaningful relationships, which is the fruit of a great life, you guys. 
outside of money, anything, just the relationships, right? If you got five people that you can really be vulnerable with and really get deep with, you are blessed. Look for those people. Look to be one of those people. That's where the fruit of life is. Man, I got preaching. I told you. I told you. All right. Oh, wow. Todd, is, thank you, Todd. I need a break. Talk to me. I wanted to mention that um, Welsh was the CEO of General Electric on IBM. Thank you, GE. Thank you. You know, we ought to do that. Dan Patrick does that in his show. You get errors and emissions. Well, here we kind of <laughs> said this, but it was that. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. Yep. Uh, Jack Welsh, right? Yep. yep. Did he just pass recently? I don't know. Okay, anyway. Um, okay, so I just wrote down, we're going to kind of, I got a few more. We got maybe, oh, look, perfect. Wow. Okay, so this is what I wrote down, literally. So it's just kind of, da, 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 da. what are some ways that we can almost ensure that we will not earn the right, that we will not earn the right, that people will not want to be influenced by us, that people, I always think about, you know, people who live their life scared. Who's going to, who, who are you going to influence? If you're living your life scared, who are you going to influence? <clears throat> and I would say, if you see somebody walking around looking scared, are you going to follow them? Right? I'd be like, I don't want to have nothing to do with that dude. He doesn't even look like he, <laughs> right? So, here are ways that will repel people from wanting to be influenced by you. They will actually subconsciously say to, your, say to themselves, I want nothing to do with whatever that person's doing because I don't want that result, right? Being a victim of your circumstances. Nobody, that, I, I mean, that should speak for itself. Who the hell is going to follow a victim? Oh, woe is me. He made me do that. Oh, circumstances. Oh, ooh. I'm, I'm not saying it's not real, but nobody's going to want to follow that. So if you are a victim, like we said, like I said the other day, you're giving it the biggest decision you can make in your life is to take dominion over your own attitude, over your own circuit, over your own uh, response to circumstances, right? So go back to the previous training. If you haven't heard that, that I, I actually like that. Um, don't give away your authority by complaining. Don't be a complainer. 90% of the people you complain to don't care. Todd, the other 10% are glad you got the problems you got, right? It doesn't do anything to complain. Nobody wants to follow or be impacted or influenced by, by a, a, an EOR. Oh, this. Don't be a complainer. See the better things in life. I'm not saying be rigidly positive, and I'll go into that in some of the morning posts because I saw a video that really impacted me. I'm not saying be rigid and be fake about it at all, but there's no – value in complaining to people about your own situation. The value is in solving those and, and creating solutions for those problems. Don't be critical of others. For God's sakes, don't gossip about people. People are attracted to people they like, right? And people like people who like people. The definition of gossiping, everybody mute you, yourselves, please, Jason. The de definition of gossiping is saying something that's not positive about someone in their absence. And I know it's hard, happens all the time, certainly in this environment. I mean, I, to me, if like, I, I won't have anything to do with those people because I know if they're talking about Todd when Todd's not here, what do you think they're saying to Todd when I'm not there, right? They're doing the same thing. Don't gossip. You talk about a repelling activity, be a gossiper. Um, oh, this is a big one. Please do not act like most people in the world right now, like other people don't have the right to their own opinion. Nobody likes that. Everyone has a right to their own opinion. No matter how weird you or I may think it is, they, Jason, you got to meet yourself, but no matter how weird or you or I think it is, I see Jason, you messed me up. Oh, no matter how weird the opinion is, they have a right to it. They're not idiots because they don't believe what we believe or think what we think. Again, I, I am not by any means a collectivist. And, and I'm not advocating for one or the other. I'm just telling you, I'm just disclosing my personality trait. That's it. That's it. I am an individualist. I heard a story once about picture this big kind of warehouse 30 foot and a pole going up the middle of it with bananas at the top 
they release, this is a study done by an Ivy League school. Um, they release six monkeys into this large room. And of course, the monkeys see the banana, so they attempt to climb that pole to get the bananas at the top of the pole. But when they do, they're sprayed with ice cold water. And monkeys, I don't know if you know this, I didn't know it, but apparently they don't like that. So they would stop and jump down. Here's the part of the study. So all six of those are in there. They've all tried to get up and now no one's going up the pole because they all understand that there's a pretty severe consequence to doing it. So they remove two of those monkeys and they put in two new monkeys. <clears throat> the cool thing is, is when those two new monkeys saw the bananas, they of course went to shoot up the pole and the other monkeys held them down and obviously were communicating to them that, hey, this isn't something you want to do. So they didn't. So some time passed and then they removed two more of the original monkeys and did two new ones and the same thing ensued. And then obviously at the end, they removed the last two and the same thing ensued. So what we ended up with in this room are six monkeys, none of which who would climb up the pole to get a banana and none of it, which really know why. Because none have ever been sprayed with water. I share that story all the time with my kids because I want them to be critical thinkers. I want them to have their own opinions. I want them to challenge opinions and want healthy debate and be pliable and open-minded and understanding the difference in cultures and backgrounds and values and perspectives and how radically different it can be just from a uh, socioeconomical, certainly a geographical radical difference would cause perceptions and realities to be different. And it's amazing to me, you guys, that we live in a society where it's as if people don't know that. I, I, I mean, somebody said something, you know, I can't believe they like that. And I go, at 42, are you still shocked that people have different opinions about things and different likes and dislikes? So don't act as if people don't have the right to their own opinion. Be open-minded. What I'm giving you are, are, are tools to keep from being a repellent, right? So we want to be attractive to people so that we can have a positive influence in their life. We don't want to re be a repellent and acting as if your opinion is the only opinion and everybody else is an idiot, don't have a right to their own opinion if it's different from yours, is not an ingratiating activity. It doesn't welcome people to an environment where they feel like they can grow. So, you know, just think about that. Don't repay hate with hate. There's a lot of hate in this world right now. Don't repay it with hate, man. Don't let them suck you in. Like I said, if someone does something to you, it's, it's your choice. It's our choice on how we respond. And I'm an A-type with a fiery uh, temper. I mean, I have a good long fuse, but once it goes, it's like it, it can get out of control. So this isn't easy for me. That's probably one of my greater challenges. If I get punched, I want to knock the crap out of somebody. But don't repay hate with hate. Don't get involved in that stream of, 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 of hate and nastiness and darkness. Please, please, please. If you want to be attractive, if you want to do that, do it. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but if you want to attract people and grow your influence and have a rich, meaningful, purpose-driven life, then, then getting into the, to the flow of hate ain't going to get you there. And um, you got to be a forgiving person. People are always going to need forgiveness. Um, and, and, and I'm reading that, that book. Oh, I didn't bring, I'm reading that book, Love Like You've Never Been Hurt. So obviously that's going to show up in my list right now. I'm not going to get into why that hopefully you guys have a general understanding on the, the mental, spiritual, uh, what health that comes with, with not bearing grudges and, and carrying around resentment. So, um, those are, are ways that we can not, you know, that we can at least know that we're not repelling people. Um, Number, the last one is, the last two is the law of process. Uh, and I can do this in a minute and a half, Todd. The law of process is there's a process that has to happen. And uh, a lot of times we want to short that process. The longest way or the longest trip from you and your goals or dreams is a shortcut. There is no shortcut, you guys. There just isn't. And that brings us to the last one is the law of sacrifice. To go up, we got to give up. Make a T-sheet today. On one side, put what you want. On the other side, put what you're willing to sacrifice. Some things are not willing or worth sacrificing. C certainly health, uh, integrity, um, you know, re relationships. Uh, certain things are not worth sacrificing. But I would say this, if your want list is, is longer than your sacrifice list, um, you're going to have some challenges. So look to sacrifice. And sacrifice can be serving others, right? Putting others in front of ourselves. Sacrificing time that we would rather be doing an activity that doesn't help us in any way to focus on 
uh, quadrant two. I mean, there's just sacrifices that we can make little ones each day. Um, you know, I'm not saying that all women should be nuns and all men should be priests. Those are pretty big sacrifices. I'm saying just be intentional each day. Sacrifice a moment of rest for a moment of learning. Sacrifice a moment of, of leisure for a moment to build a relationship, right? And spend time in quadrant two and be intentional. All right, Todd, that's about all I got. I hope I wasn't all over the place today. I kind of, like I said, I expected to do the book, uh, but we had to pivot. Hopefully this was helpful for you all. I want you to know that I am authentic in this. All this stuff is stuff that uh, I try to put in my life. Certainly there are seasons where I'm more intentional than others. And there's some things that I'm better at than, than others. And uh, I am certainly not, have not arrived and I am still a work in progress. But I would say whether I do these well or whether I don't makes them no less true. Each one of these are laws and principles that if you put into implementation in some form or fashion in your life, you will see a result. And I'm telling you, when you start getting those results, you start becoming attractive and you start really growing your influence over people and, and enriching your life and creating that, that sphere with, you know, that, that, that we, you can live in and really become the best you we can be. All right. Anything else, Todd? Errors, emissions, cares, concerns? I, Dana Boyd had a nice positive comment. She said, when things really started picking up with my business because Amy had put my link at the bottom for nightly update, I spent hours responding to messages on my website, emails, texts. I missed a lot of sleep, but it was worth it. All right. So I don't know if you guys can hear Todd, but look at Dana Boyd's um, uh, post. Absolutely, Dana. I remember, thank you for sharing that. And it's like, it's so easy to relate. What a great example. And we'll close with this. It's so easy to relate with you and connect with you right now, Danny, even though I can't see you because I too understand what that is. And when we share that we've had some common ground in a sacrificial area to grow ourselves, our business, our influence, our impact on people, there's an easier road to connection, right? Because I remember when I was working a full-time job and the full-time job was, you know, 45, 48 hours a week. And coming home and, and turning on the little AC in my garage and having dinner and everything. And then I'd run out in the garage and Stacy would go to the back and she'd been working all day. And we worked till two, three in the morning. I mean, you talk about sacrifice and sleep. Uh, so totally relate to that, Dana. Thank you so much for sharing. I hope that in the coming uh, training sessions that we will have more of those, more of you and less of me. I think it's a good thing as we get to go forward because you guys are getting a, a pretty good understanding on some of the rules and principles that I want to live by when I'm getting it right. <laughs> oh, which is probably fewer than more for sure. So again, guys, this is as good for me as it is for you. I, as, as, as impactful and as this is being in my life, honestly, and I'm so appreciative of you guys being here, but honestly, if no one were doing this, I would still do it because um, I am getting some results and I really like it. And my kids like it and my wife likes it. She's letting me know left and right. Um, and uh, let's close with that. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for dedicating time and sacrificing time to be better. I am attracted to you. I see who's on. I look at everyone who attends these and know that I know your name and why, because it matters to me. I want to be focused on people that share my values. Not that mine are right or wrong, but they're mine. And I know that there are people that share the same values and I want to be around you, you all. Thank you for being here. I, I admire you for taking time. Think about how many hundreds if not, or thousands of, of reps we have. And Todd, I don't know the number, but I think if we had 25 or 30, we'd be really lucky. So I, uh, I almost did, I'll close with this. I almost took a video and I will this week. When I get here in the morning and it's still dark, there's like a big parking lot because there's a lot of offices in this, in this uh, office park. And there's like only one truck here. And you can tell the truck is like a commercial truck that stays there overnight. Like nobody's here. I'm the first one. Talk about getting an edge, man. So whoever's on this, whoever's watches this, or if you're on it right now, you got an edge. You got an edge. All right. Love you guys. I can't see anything tied to get out of it. I hope you do it. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being here. Um, man, go out and, and spread your influence. Increase it. Mm -hmm.